All right, we want to welcome you all tonight for our fourth class in the Living in Abundance class. What did we talk about the first week? What is abundance, right? Remember all the boxes with the tags on them and all the incredible amount of promises, provisions, and blessings and that God's made available to us when we get born again? Bring that back. What did we talk about the second week? Your story matters. Janie talked about how important we are. Our story is to the kingdom of God and that we need to walk in freedom if we're going to walk in the fullness of that. Yeah? Arden talked last week. You better remember. What we believe, right? How important it is what we believe. And we're going to push into a whole lot of that tonight. We're going to be talking about our identity and truth. <clears throat> We need to know what we believe about our relationship with God. And hopefully by the time you walk out of here tonight, you're going to have a pretty good resolve about that. Now, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a son, a daughter, or as an orphan? Do you see yourself as a nuisance? Do you see yourself as rejected? Do you see yourself as accepted and wanted? How about righteous? Or condemned. You know, there's a whole lot of ways we can see ourselves, but we're going to press in tonight and show you what the truth is. So let's pray. God, we thank you and praise you for your word. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We need you to come and give us revelation of what the truth is. God, we, we confess that we've believed lies for a long time and part truths, and, and we ask tonight that you reach into us and into our souls and make a a transformation, make, make a change in us at the core of who we are that we see and recognize and know and believe and apply truth to our lives. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now. Come and have your way in us. We want everything that you've got for us tonight. Amen? Yes. All right. So what does determine who we really are? Is it, is it the record of your past? Is it your, your failures and your successes, what you've done in, in the past? Is it what other people say about you? Not when they talk about you? How about what I think about myself and what I say about myself? Look at Proverbs 23, 7. It says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So as a person thinks in their heart or they believe in their heart, so are they. Proverbs 27, 19 says, as in water, face reflects face, so a man's heart reveals what? The things in our heart will dictate the way that we live. Yeah? What we believe about ourselves will set up the way we live. Period. But it won't change truth. If we're not believing according to truth, then we won't live according to truth. Does that make sense? That's what Arden was talking about last week. It matters what we believe because it's going to set up the way we live. So look, let's look at this. I love this picture of Jesus. What, what determines who we are, our identity? Jesus is always our perfect example, Matthew 3.13. This is when Jesus went to get baptized. He went to John the Baptist. Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me. And Jesus said, Permitted at this time, for this is what's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So we need to do this, even though it doesn't make sense to you. Then he permitted him, and after being baptized, Jesus immediately came up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. Now listen. And behold, a voice out of heaven said what? Come on. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am what? Well pleased. God declared that over him. Then, Je then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Thank you very much. After he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. Understatement of the century. And the tempter came to him. And listen to what the enemy said to him. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to be turned into bread. Right? 
And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but man shall live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So God had just declared what over Jesus? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He goes into the desert and the devil says what? If you are the son of God, prove it. And Jesus basically says, I live by what God says. I don't have to prove it. God said it. It's what? It's true. Therefore, I live by it. That's, that's how we find our identity. We find out what God said about us, and we believe that and live by it. Yeah? We don't let the enemy talk us out of it. We don't let other people that have trash talk about us to talk us out of it. We don't let our own minds that, that think we're junk talk us out of it. Yes? We get in line with truth. Three things we got to do if this is going to work for us. First, we got to know what God has said. Yeah? What has he declared true? Second, we got to what? Believe that it's true about us. Yes? And third, we got to do what? Apply it to our lives. We got to start to live in line with truth. Yeah? You can have, go have all the best teachers teach you all the best teachings, and if you don't do your part, it's worth nothing. Yeah? If you, don't, if you never apply it, you never believe it and apply it to your life, it'll never benefit you at all. You'll never get the abundance that God has for you. <laughs> That's good stuff. I don't care what you think. All right. We're going to look at the body, soul, and spirit teaching. I, the other week I asked, and, and only about three people held up their hand when I said, have you seen this? So... I don't know how to explain identity without showing this to you, so we are going to look at it tonight. Uh, it's not perfect, but it will show us what changed in us when we got born again. It'll, it'll talk to us about our, our relationship with God. It'll talk to us about our spiritual potential when we're born again. Yeah? Do you know what that stuff is? If I asked you, could you tell me? I, I know I couldn't for a long time. I had a lot of pieces of information. But when I got this, it made all, a whole bunch of that stuff fit together for me. A whole bunch of scriptures came together and made sense. So I'm, I'm believing that's going to happen for all of us tonight. <clears throat> and and when, until we get done, we're going to end up seeing and declaring some things that God has declared true about us. Setting us up to, to begin to walk in that truth and get it into us and get, apply it to our lives. Is that ready to roll? Yeah. All right. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace... Himself sanctify you completely, set you apart, make you Christ-like, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord. And our illustrations about this, I am a spirit, I'm a spirit man, I have a soul, and I live in a body. So we're three parts. Does that make sense? All right. Our natural bodies are really important because when we're in right relationship with God, they're the vehicle that he uses to interact with the natural realm, to minister to people, to, to serve people, whatever, whatever his will is. So our, our bodies are really important. Your soul is made up of three parts. It's your mind, and that's your, your intellect. That's uh, the place where you... Store up all your memories where you have all your perceptions of the things that have happened to you, all of your understanding of things. It's where your character and, and your nature is all within this soul. Has your emotions. Your emotions are your reaction to what your mind perceives about your given situation. When you see something, when you experience something, you're going to think a certain way about it, and how you think about it is going to cause you to feel a certain way. And when you think and feel a certain way about something, you're going to make a decision of your will as to how you're going to respond to it. Does that make sense? Your feelings follow your thoughts. So if you're walking around with whacked out feelings all the time, what's wrong? Your thoughts are whacked out, yeah? There's something that's got to come in line with truth, and it'll bring your feelings and your actions in line with truth, too. This, th this has helped me incredibly, yeah? 
you get really upset, and you're just upset. It's not a matter of why am I upset. I'm just mad. I'm in a bad mood. But if I can figure out why, I can go back and figure out what caused that, yeah, and, and bring my mind in line with truth. Deal with it. Your heart is another piece. And it's, it's a subset of your soul. I think it's part of your mind. It's a place where I believe we, we hold our, our beliefs, our motives, attitudes, and desires. The place of our deepest beliefs, the things that we believe so deeply that even if we don't see anything happening in the natural, we believe that it's true to the point where we live accordingly. We live as if it has already happened. Yeah? Those deep beliefs set up our instinctive behavior, the things that we think about without thinking about it. Yeah? Somebody jumps out and scares you, you're going to make a snap decision, and you make that decision according to how your mind's programmed. Do you fight? Do you scream? Do you run? That's all according to how you have your mind programmed. Yeah? All right. Your spirit's who you really are. You're, you are a spirit person. Your spirit's designed to have relationship with God. That's what he's there for. That's his purpose. Yeah? The condition of your spirit determines your identity. I'll show that to you in a minute. Yeah. Overall, what happens is your body uses the five senses to experience the world around it. It's, it's amazing how God made our bodies, and, and it turns all that into electric impulses, and it sends it to our brain, which is part of our body. It's me, right? But in our brain is our mind. <laughs> our mind is like the program that runs on the, on the hardware. It's the software that runs on the hardware, right? So the mind understands all those electric impulses and recognizes what's going on around it, associates what it's seeing with all of my memories and understandings and perceptions. Is this, is this smoke, smoking you? This is, if you can get this, it'll help you to understand what's going on around you, what your battle is every day. If I can realize that my body's just experienced it, my mind is saying, okay, I recognize this, then when my mind recognizes that my emotions are stirred because of how my mind perceives it, okay? And then because of that, I make a decision how I'm going to act. Um, I have a little story that I use. There, there's two 10-year-old kids. One of them has a dad that just loves him to pieces. Dad comes home, doesn't matter if he's had a good day or a bad day, he comes in and swoops that kid up in his arms and gives him a big hug and says, I'm glad to see you. He's always got gummy bears in his pocket for the kid to have a snack. But when that, that boy knows that his dad loves him and that he's important, yeah, that he is accepted. There's boy number two, 10 years old, lives on the same street. His dad comes home and he's angry. He's like a bear with a sore butt. He comes in the door, and all he wants is to get to his chair and get a beer and, and sit down and be left alone, watch TV. When a young boy comes up and tries to get his dad's attention, talk to him about the day, interact with him, dad smacks him over the head and knocks him to the floor. What's that boy now? I'm not accepted. I'm not loved. Right? So both kids are sitting at the window. Dad pulls into the driveway. What's the body do? It sees dad pull into the driveway, sends that information to the brain, the mind picks it up. What's the mind say? First boy, the one that's loved, what's the mind say? It says, this is a good thing. I remember this being good. What's the emotions do, Heidi? Yay, Yay dad's home, good deal, I'm excited. I'm, I, I am waiting to see him, right? I am so glad that he's home. What might he decide to do? Yeah, run to the door, greet him. Jump up in his arms, right? Boy number two sees the same thing. It's his dad coming home. The body sees. Dad's in the driveway. The mind says, no oh crap. This isn't good. What's the emotion say? Fear. Anxious. Right? Run away. <laughs> now, run away is over here. But it, this is bad. This is unsafe. This is unhealthy. And, and then the decision is, 
get out of there before he knocks you down. Right? Do, do you, are you starting to see how this whole thing works? Because of the experience of each of those children seeing their dad walk in, their, their memories, their understanding, their perception, their experience totally changes how they feel and how they act to, to basically the same experience. Yes? All right. Let me ask you this. Do you, how do you perceive your relationship with God? Does your mind say, this is a good thing, or does your mind say, oh, crap? Does your emotions say, oh, I'm so excited? Or do they say, this isn't safe. I'm not accepted. You hear what I'm saying? Because what do you decide to do when you're in church on Sunday morning and the presence of God shows up? Do you run in or do you run away? Now let me ask you this. If you run away, is it true that God rejects you, is angry with you, or is not safe? What's the truth? In Christ I am loved, I am accepted, I am safe in his, in his presence. It is good in his presence, right? And if I change the way I think, I'll change the way I feel and therefore change the way that I act when his presence is there. Yes? The problem isn't that God doesn't want to meet with me. <laughs> it's that I'm not seeing things right. I'm not believing right in my heart, so I'm not thinking, feeling, and acting right. Yes? All right. Back to our illustration. This is how I believe when God created man, when he created the Garden of Eden, this is what I believe Adam looked like. He had a spirit, a soul, and a body. His spirit man was pure and righteous. There was no sin. And he had relationship with God. They walked in the cool of the day. They talked, right? What happened? God said, there's a tree in the middle of the garden that I don't want you eating from. You can have anything else you want, but don't eat from that tree because if you eat from that tree in that day, you will surely die, okay? The snake comes along, just like he did for Jesus, said, did God really say that? You won't surely die, okay? So they ate from the tree. In that day, did they die? Now they lived for a long time in their bodies, right? What happened? God didn't lie. What died? Sin corrupted their spirit man. And it made this thing dirty, corrupt, nasty. And here's, here's the worst of it. It broke their ability to have relationship with God. It destroyed their ability to have relationship with God. God put them out of the garden. He didn't interact with them the way he used to. It wasn't possible because that was corrupt and couldn't, couldn't connect with the holiness of God. <clears throat> now, I believe that this is how we are born naturally, with the same corrupt spirit man that's unable to relate to God. Okay? And, and guess what? The way that I think and feel and act gets trained by this corrupt, nasty, godless, rebellious, selfish, dead spirit man. Yes? How, how, how's a two-year-old act? What do they say? Me or no, right? <laughs> or I want. But it's completely selfish. It, it's the programming of this mind that is is made completely selfish to serve me, to make me safe, comfortable, and happy, and in control, to, to make me the main event for everything that I experience. Yes? That, that's how we're born naturally. Listen to Ephesians 2. It says, once you were dead, you were dead like this, <laughs> doomed forever, condemned to hell because of your many sins, okay, Sins, what did that to you? 
You used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to what? Obey God. All of us used to live that way. Following the what? Where's the passions and desires at? The passions and desires of our evil nature. That's programmed into our soul. We were born with an evil nature and we were under God's anger just like everyone else. So we were born slaves to sin, corrupt in bondage to sin. When this is your identity, you're sinful. That's what you do. Yes? When you look at people in the world and wonder why they sin, it's because that's who they are. Yes? All right. In that state, we're helpless and hopeless to do anything to change it, right? Apart from Jesus, our identity is determined by our corruption and our sinfulness. That's who we are. Is that good news? Not very, right? Because we're doomed to hell and have nothing to say about it. Now, what happens when we get born again? Titus 3.3. 3 says, once we too were foolish and disobedient, okay, that talks about our behavior is rebellious against God because why? Our minds are rebellious against God, right? We were misled and became slaves to the many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. That's a picture of this guy being in control. Okay? But, I love the buts in the Bible. Verse 4, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done. There's nothing that we can do to change our identity. <clears throat> but because of his mercy, he washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. And because of his grace, he what? Declared us what? Righteous. When we got born again, God declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit what? Because he made us righteous, we can know that as we walk in that righteousness, we will inherit eternal life. God made us clean and new through new birth of the spirit man in us. I'm going to share that to you here in a minute. By putting his Holy Spirit in us. Now, as long as we commit to living in that relationship, dependent on Jesus' sacrifice to make us righteous, to make us holy, as long as we stay in, living in faith that that's done that work in us, we can know that we're born again, that we have eternal life. That's good news. Yeah, the work of the cross, Ephesians 2, 4, says, but God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so very much that while we were dead because of our sins, while we looked like this, Jesus gave his life. He gave his life when he raised Christ from the dead. He raised us from the dead along with Christ, and we are seated with him in the heavenly places. All because we're what? One with Jesus. That's where our identity gets changed. That's where our potential goes from zero to infinite. That's where everything switches. Okay? Romans 6.6 6 says, Knowing this, know this, that our old man, this guy here, was what? Crucified with Jesus that the body of sin might be done away with it, we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he died, he who, he who has died has been freed from sin. Do me a favor, Dan. Take that thing over the cross. Just set it for the cross for me. Thank you. My old man, my old corrupt, sinful man, has been crucified with Christ through faith in Jesus. Yes? through faith in the work of the cross. If I could hang that thing on a cross, I would. But we're setting it there because I want you to remember that the old man is dead. 
He was crucified. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. That's I over there. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. When I get born again, I become a new creation. The old man is dead. I become a new creation. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. Yes? Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The old man is dead. I want to make you tired of hearing me say that. When we enter salvation, the old man dies. We are recreated, reborn, resurrected, new creation in Christ. This new man is Christ-like. He is holy. He is righteous before God. Why? How do I know that? Because God said so. If I believe that the work of the cross is true and that it's applied to my life, then this is true about me regardless of how I feel. Yes? You need to make that decision. Are you going to believe the truth? Or are you going to believe what's always been true? Because truth about you just changed. It used to be true that you were a sinful, crusty, nasty person who couldn't relate to God. But the instant that you get born again, that's no longer true. It changes because God said so through the cross. Yes? <laughs> I want you to see that my identity is not that old crusty, nasty, messed up, corrupt, dead spirit man fixed up. They didn't take him down to the garage and put new paint and new tires and tune up the engine. They didn't send him to church and teach him to act right. He's dead. God's solution is execution. That's the only way you get rid of the old man. And you become a new creation in Christ, holy and righteous as you stand before God. Man, something inside of you ought to be jumping. Yeah? I hear people say, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Horse crap. That sinner is crucified. You're not just a sinner saved by grace. You're a new creation in Christ, holy and righteous as you stand before God. Get that. Get that in your head and in your heart. Start to believe that and, and react correctly to that and live that way. Yeah? This is good stuff. It will change your life. You have to understand this identity thing before you can walk in the stuff that God has for you because as long as you think I'm just an old turd and, and God doesn't really like me, he just puts up with me, you're never going to walk in what he has for you because of you, not because of him. Yeah? You got a million dollars in the bank, you're eating out of dumpsters. I know. I lived there for a long time. Still learning. Colossians 1.21 says, And you who once were alienated from God and enemies of God in your minds by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled you to himself in the body of his flesh through death to present you how? And, and, where? Say that again. He's made me holy and righteous, blameless and above reproach in his sight. He sees me that way. How do I know? He said so. Do I feel that way? No, I still feel like that. But if I'm going to believe what he says and start to live that way, I've got to start somewhere. Yeah? I've got to know what he said, believe that it's true about me, and start to apply it to my life. Yes? All right. 
Not only do I become a new spirit man, but there's something else that happens. Romans 8, 11 says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, what? Lives in you. So not only do I become a new creation, but the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in my life. Yeah? Is that good? The Spirit of truth? <laughs> That's good. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, The person who is joined with the Lord is what? One spirit with them. So not only do, does the Holy Spirit come to live in me, Amen. but something completely miraculous happens, and I am no longer a new creation with the Holy Spirit with me. I become one spirit with him. Take two glasses of water, dump them together. What do you have? Can't separate them, right? They're one, right? Can you separate them back out? Ephesians 5.8 says, once you were darkness, that guy over there, but now you are what? Light in the Lord. So do what? Walk or live as what? Children of light. Start to walk in your new identity. Start to live in your new identity. Acts 3.19 says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing can come from what? When we come through the cross, we can now enter the presence of God because this is now holy and righteous and able to have what? Relationship with him. That's what God's been after ever since the Garden of Eden. That's the whole purpose of the cross, to bring us back into a place where we can have relationship with him. Yes? There's a whole other teaching about all the stuff that's in between there, but there was a whole lot of years and a whole lot of things that happened up to that point where God accomplished what he wanted all along through Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, the first thing that happened was God ripped that veil that was between the holy place and the most holy place, the thing that kept people out of God's presence. He ripped it in half the instant that Jesus died and gave up his life and said, the way is now open into my presence because of this. Your identity completely changes when this happens in you. When you were like that, you had zero potential spiritually. Nada. When you're like this, you have all that stuff that we had on those boxes and a whole bunch more available to you. The whole abundance, the whole everything of God available to you through the Holy Spirit. Yes? Is that good news? That's shouting ground. That's good stuff. <clears throat> now, this, this all happens in an instant when we get born again. When we give our lives to Christ when we confess our sins and ask him to forgive us and, and say, God, I repent of my old way of life. I don't want to live that way anymore. I commit to follow you. I commit to do your will. Yes, I give my life over to you. Have your way. And this happens. Bang. It's an instantaneous, miraculous, supernatural, all of God, nothing of us. We got nothing in it but to say, wow, that was great. <laughs> and to believe that it happened in us. Some people feel things, some people experience things, some people don't. But if I believe that God did that work in me, it belongs to me. Yes? <clears throat> now, how many of you, after you got born again, never had another bad thought or desire or you? Good, come and lay hands on me because I haven't experienced that. Everything, everything when you get born again this is still programmed how? To live according to the old nasty, selfish, rebellious, godless, sinful self. I'm st I still think and feel and act just like that when I get born again. Yes? So what has to happen? 
What's got to change? Well, while you're thinking about it, I'm going to get coughed up because I'm drawing out. What has to change? There it is. We got to start thinking according to. We got to know what it says, believe that it's true about us, and start to live it. It's not easy. It's good. Yeah? Ephesians 4.22 says, Throw off the old sinful nature. What's the old sinful nature? It's this programming that's in here. The old sinful man is dead. He's crucified with Christ. But his nature is here. Our character, our nature, our personality is here. It's an internal part of us. And, and that old corrupt junk resides here. So it says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life that's corrupted by lust and deception, and instead let the Spirit renew your what? Thoughts and your mind and your heart. Renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature that's created to be like God, truly what? Where's your new nature? It's here. This is your new true identity. This is your new nature. And he's saying, you have it. Now put it on. Yeah? That's, that's our lifelong walk of salvation, our journey of being made more and more like Jesus. Churchy word, sanctification. Yeah? That's what we do after we get born again. We increasingly teach this to think, feel, and act like this. There's your journey. There's your battle. Where's your battle take place? Right there. Yeah? Where's the power of the enemy? When he gets us to believe what? Lies. When I think, believe lies, what happens? I feel and I act wrong. <laughs> Isn't that cool? It's so simple. Why is freedom ministry so impacting when, when God reveals a lie that we believe and we renounce that lie and start to declare and begin to believe according to truth? What happens? We change how we think and feel and act. <laughs> we get set free. The power of that lie is here. Yes? All right, here's some truth for you. If you've trusted Jesus to deal with your sin, given your life to him, if you've repented of your old life, committed to love-driven love obedience to him, then you have been what? Born again, yes? And God has done a mighty work in you. He, he's made you completely able to live a Christ-like life. He has set you free from the power of sin. If you're born again, you don't have to sin anymore. It's not saying you won't, because this is still a mess. But don't, you don't have to. You used to have to when that guy was in charge. But you don't have to anymore. There's a scripture that says, and if we do sin, we have an advocate before the Father. It doesn't say every time you sin, we have an ad advocate before the Father, because... You'll just sin because that's who you are. That's not true anymore. He set us free from sin. And if we do sin, we've got an advocate. That's good. But keep pressing into being like your true identity and how you live. All right. Let's see what time it is. We're supposed to be done at half past. Well, we're going to go a little bit yet anyway. Well, we're going to smoke this last part, but it's not going to take 10 minutes probably. Um, there's power in the spoken word. When we choose to believe something, what if, what if I, I think and feel like a total low life 
who just screws everything up. And, and I find out that God has said that I'm holy and righteous and without blame as I stand before him. How do I reconcile that? What do I do with that? Is it, am I being a hypocrite if I say, if I feel and experience that I'm a sinful mess and I screw everything up, that's the reality of my life, but God says I'm holy and righteous. Am I a hypocrite if I say that I'm holy and righteous? Why not? It's an act of faith in what he has declared true about me. And he's right. What did Jesus say to the devil? I don't have to prove it. I have nothing in it. God said it. It's true. So I'm going to live according to it. Right? So the first part of that is for me to say, in my mind, I see, God, what you have said is true about me. And I choose to believe that. I can't make myself believe it right now most of the time, but I choose to believe that. So I'm the, one of the ways we do is to declare what he has said. Yeah, There's power in the spoken word. So just by declaring, by the blood of Jesus, I am holy and righteous as I stand before God. I am blameless before God because of the blood of Jesus. I may not feel that way at all, but is it true? Why is it true? Because God said it. And I live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Yeah? <laughs> oh, I love it. We're going to do some of this. We're going to show you some scriptures. Here we go. Hebrews 10, 14 says, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are what? Being sanctified. So if I am in the process of being sanctified, being made more like Jesus taking off the old, putting on the new, if I'm committed to that process, what does it say? I am what? Come on. I'm perfected forever. Even though this isn't done yet, God declares that if I'm committed to that journey, I am already eternally perfected. This is my identity. Yes? Yes? Let's, you have some, I don't know, your paper's all black, all black ink. Okay, there's, they're in italics there, I think. The first one says, I choose. Do you see that? Yeah. Let's declare it together. I choose to be increasingly Christ-like by obeying the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I am perfected forever. Where? In God's eyes. You can make that declaration about yourself because God said it. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what other people around you are saying. It doesn't matter if somebody asks you to prove it. I don't have to prove it. God said it. It's true. Yes? Here we go. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? Cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Woo-hoo, I'll take that. Yeah? You ready to declare? I am forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness as I daily confess my sins to him. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become what? Oh, I think that scripture is awesome. How do I become the righteousness of God in him? Right there. Yeah? Now I need to put it on. So let's work at putting it on. Here we go. Because Jesus' sacrifice is applied to my life, I am the... Ah, sounds good just to hear you say it. Is it true? Is it true about you? Keep declaring it. Because the more you declare those things, the more you speak those things, the more you tell your mind, no, I'm not a turd, I'm not messed up, I'm not all that stuff that I used to be. 
I am who God says I am, and you start to speak those things and, and bring your thoughts into line with that truth, you'll start to, come on, live that way. It's not about changing your behavior. That's the end result. It's about being in relationship with the Holy Spirit, hearing his voice, doing what he says, bringing your life in line with truth. This is one of the mighty weapons of warfare that God has given us to tear down strongholds and all those things that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. Yeah? Declaring truth. Know and believe and declare in truth. Okay. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you will proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. All that stuff is true about us as born-again believers. <clears throat> Legally, it belongs to us. Experientially, we may not have applied it yet. We may not be walking in it yet. But it's ours. Yeah? This is where that warehouse of all that stuff, all that abundance that God says is, and his promises, provisions, and blessings is available to us. It's there. Here we go. God chose me and set me apart from the world to himself. It is my job to minister to God and to proclaim his praise. God called me out of darkness and into... Hallelujah. You've already made the trip out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Now we start to live that way. Yes? Your identity is already decided if you would just walk in it. Ephesians 5, 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Okay? I was darkness, but Jesus has made me light in him. I always wanted to know, how am I in him and him in me? That doesn't make sense to me. Now it makes sense to me. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus. Yes? Yes? He lives in me and I live in him. You, you see scripture say, I am in Christ. My new creation is one with the Holy Spirit, with his spirit. I hope this is making some things click in you. There's so many things like that that just, I read all these churchy things and they didn't make sense, but when I saw this stuff, it's like, ah, I get it. I see how that works. Colossians 1, 20, uh, 19. I'm going to get down to verse 22. It says, Now God has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own what? Presence. And now you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But, 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 but you must continue to what? Believe this truth and stand firmly in it. <laughs> there it is. It's yours if you'll just believe it. Take it by faith and begin to walk in it. It belongs to you as a born-again believer because of what God said, not because of what I did or didn't do. Yes? Here we go. Because Jesus' blood is applied to my life, I am reconciled to God. I am at peace with God because I continue to believe what God has said and live accordingly. I am holy and blameless without a single fault. It's true. Don't care how you feel. It's true. <laughs> I love it. Holy Spirit, I ask for revelation. I ask you soak this into us. 
in, in deeper ways than we've ever seen it before, in ways that bring us into relationship, in just incredible ways that just oh, set us free into knowing you, to trust in you, to believe in you. <clears throat> you want to do a couple more? First Corinthians six nine. Don't you know that those who do wrong will have no share in the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, <clears throat> who are idol worshipers, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, abusers, and swindlers, none of these will have a share in the kingdom of God. There was a time when some of you were just like that, but now your sins have been washed away and you have been set apart for God sanctified, made holy, you have been made right with God, justified, just as if I'd never sinned, because of what the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God have done for you. All that old junk is no longer my identity. This is now my identity. It's my job to put on my new identity and get rid of that old junk, yes, I don't just keep all that old crusty nastiness in, in my life and say, well, I've been born again, so I'm good. But I increasingly walk in relationship with him and obedience to him and bring my life in line with truth. Yes? Here we go. Because of what Jesus and the Holy Spirit did for me, my sins have been washed away. I have been set apart for God. I am justified with God just as if I'd never Hallelujah. <clears throat> Say that to yourself. Because of the cross, it's like I never sinned. He's, this is born again. Your new identity is born again. What history does a born again baby have? Nada. All this stuff is still here and needs reckoned with, and God knows that. And he wants us to walk with him. He wants us dependent on him for every day of our life, everything in our life, yes? He knows that's there. But there's a journey that we walk in relationship with him. All right. Hebrews 4.14. Since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we want. Believe, hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There will we, we will receive what? His mercy, and we will find grace to help in our time of need, when we need it most. Where do we find what we need? In his presence. We live here. His presence is in us. Guys, I, I can't honestly say I understand this completely and walk in it completely. I don't. I, I, I need more revelation. I need to learn to live here. My flesh, the selfish stuff in me wants to pull me over into this old junk but this is always 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 available to me and I will never be rejected when I come to him because I can come boldly to the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace in my time of weakness and my time of need I won't be rejected it's like the first dead you can run to him you ready through faith I Yes, Ted Kepner, am cleansed with the blood of Jesus. Therefore, I can come confidently before God's throne when I am in need. I know that I will find mercy and grace. I know that I will not. Hallelujah. <laughs> you can know. And you know what? When you just screwed up for the umpteenth time and you're feeling like dirt, 
and you want to crawl under a rock somewhere instead of going to God, that's the time when you can come confidently into his presence to receive grace and mercy in your time of need. Not because you want to hold on to that, but because you want to get rid of it. You want to repent of it. Yes? Don't run away. Run in. One more. Isaiah 61.10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation, and he has wrapped me with a robe of what? Righteousness. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. Why? Because of the cross. Because of Jesus. Because of the blood. He's robed me, clothed me in salvation, and wrapped me in righteousness. You ready? God clothed me in salvation. God wrapped me in Jesus' righteousness. It is a done deal. Holy Spirit, teach us to live there. There's a bunch more of these, but it's late and I'm losing my voice, so I'm going to quit. Guys, it's all there for us. Your identity has changed from that to this because of the cross. That's dead. It's crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Now we need to learn to apply that to our lives. Questions, thoughts? Does this make sense to you? It took me a long time to get this to make sense to me. So if it doesn't, don't, don't fret, okay? Stay with it. If you come to any more of my classes, you'll probably see it again. But there's so much truth here. There's so much understanding of how we live in the great things that God's given us, how we apply it to our lives. Questions? I'm going to wrap it up. <laughs> Either really smoked you or really did a good job. <laughs> I hope it's a good job. All right, let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you, thank you, thank you for truth. Thank you for the word. Jesus, you are the living word. You are truth. Holy Spirit, you make the word come alive in us. You make it real to us, to the place where we can live it. And I ask right now over each one that's here and each one that's watching, God, that that, that you just make this come alive in us. That it's not just information that some guy stood up front and talked about, but it's revelation that gets down and deep in our hearts and changes the way that we live, the way that we think and feel and act. Holy Spirit, teach us to live out of our new identity, our true identity, out of our new creation person, out of, out of our union with you, Holy Spirit. Transform us. Make us Christ-like in every way that our lives are a living demonstration of your presence in us, that our lives display the glory, the goodness of God to everybody around us increasingly as we walk with you. Draw us into that deep place of, of fellowship and relationship with you, that we, that we trust you, and with love-driven obedience we follow you every day of our lives. God, be glorified in us and through us, and we praise you for it. Amen? Amen. All right.